My grandma Millie had a rule. The rule was you show up for the celebration. Or as Grandma Millie used to say, you go to the simcha. My grandma lived to 98 years old, as many of you know, and her beloved, my grandfather, lived to 90. And I truly attribute their longevity to the fact that they went dancing literally every single night before dinner. They never turned down a doers on the rocks, and they embodied to the very end this rule. They just showed up. So here's the idea. Life is precious and precarious, and you never know what tomorrow will bring, but you're here today. So show up in body and spirit. Now, we grew up hearing this rule. I even wrote a book about it coming out in January. What kind of healing is possible in our hearts and in our society when we show up in sorrow, in celebration, in solidarity? What I didn't realize when I asked my mother to be an advanced reader of this book is that she would so deeply internalize the message of my book when it mattered most, like in a time of war, when I was scheduled to be in Israel for a bat mitzvah, but seriously considering not going, that she would hold me to the thesis of my book and insist that I show up, even as I thankfully was able to convince the rest of the family to stay at home. So I did. I went to Israel last week. The guilt of a Jewish mother can be a powerful force for good in the world sometimes. The bat mitzvah was two weeks to the day after the massacres in the south of Israel. The community there, like here, is absolutely reeling. Very close friends, including my niece's teacher of Torah, had already lost beloved children. Debbie's son, Aryeh, was a beautiful, soulful young man, and just the night before, had led the kids in the Simchat Torah HaKafot, taking his giant talit and jumping up and down and dancing and singing with all of the children only hours later, on Shabbat morning, he was among the first that were called up to help save the communities that were under attack in the South, and he died almost immediately. The community desperately needed a simcha, and our sweet niece, with her pitch-perfect Torah reading and her heartfelt Devar Torah, offered a momentary comfort to our anguished hearts, just as Shai did for all of us today. Gam betoch ha'etzev, she said, even in the deepest sadness, yesh hamshchiyut asia v'simcha shel hadorot habayim. It is precisely in the continuity of our actions that we cultivate joy for generations to come. I prayed that she was right. That reading Torah, that whispering the words of mourners Kaddish, that lobbing soft candies at the head of the bat mitzvah girl, all of these were acts of defiance planting the seeds for a future that would be brighter than the present that it was growing out of. A time of healing and peace, like our prophets imagined. Od yeshama ba'are Yehuda uvechutzot Yerushalayim kol sason v'kol simcha. Jeremiah said, can we imagine that yet again one day might be heard in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem the voice of joy and the voice of gladness? And isn't this, after all, the most Jewish wish there is? That even in this time of heartache, we remember that there's another way, a better way. And that dream will become our reality one day. And even if we don't live to see it, maybe our descendants will. After Shabbat, it was a day of sacred witness. First to the Expo Center in Tel Aviv, here, the leaders of the democracy protests, those Israelis deemed just weeks ago by the governing coalition and their supporters to be traitors because of their commitment to democracy and their desire for peace, these folks stepped into the void of this absentee government and demonstrated the true power of civil society. Tens of thousands of volunteers organized to respond to the physical emotional, financial, and educational needs of the 70,000 refugees from the southern towns of Israel who have all had to be relocated. Achim Beneshek, this is powered by high tech and fueled by love and solidarity, forces of untold strength and human goodness. 
With my brother and my dear friend, Rabbi Amichai Lau Lavi, I visited the camp of the families of the bereaved, of the captives in the heart of Tel Aviv, where they sit together with signs holding vigil until their loved ones are brought home. And then Michael and I went to Kibbutz Shifaim. This is a kibbutz north of Tel Aviv, where those who were rescued from Kfar Aza, one of the small towns in the south that was hardest hit, have been relocated. The night before, as I was working out the details of this visit, I read out loud the text from the community's representative. Let's meet at 5.30 so that you can walk around and speak with the survivors, it said. It was in that moment that my stoic and whip-smart nephew, the kid who, for the previous two weeks, volunteered day and night directing adults in the depot on how to better coordinate drop-offs of breast milk and socks and baby food, it was in that moment that his knees gave out. Survivors, he repeated, and I understood his shock. Survivors, refugees, these are words of the diaspora. These are words of a pre-state Jewish existence, words that rang out through the Jewish experience of Poland and Russia and Austria and Iraq and Tunisia. These words are foreign to the Israeli experience. After all, part of the raison d'etre of the state was to build a safe haven, a refuge for Jews fleeing persecution, a place to ensure that we would never again fall victim to the horrors of the diaspora until we did. The kibbutz ground where these people had been displaced to felt like a DP camp after the Shoah. People walking around with bandaged heads and hands and lists, handwritten lists in Sharpies on giant post-its of the funerals, many of them each hour by name, Bilcha Epstein, 10 a.m., Orly Schwartzman, 11 a.m., David Schwartzman, 11 a.m., Roi Idan, 11 a.m., Smadar Idan, 11 a.m., Mira Stachal, 1 p.m., Omer Harash, 2 p.m., Nitzan Liebstein, 3 p.m., and on and on and on, page after page, my guides, who themselves grew up on Kfar Aza, walked us through the grassy fields of the kibbutz, which were dotted with small gathering spaces, picnic blankets, each one surrounded by 10 to 20 people sitting in plastic chairs. This is Shiva, said one of my guides. Shivot, the other one said, correcting him. Shivot, when there are multiple Shivas, in this case, hundreds of them, all happening at once. I went into some of the circles and got to speak with some of the survivors. The hunting of Jews, the torture, the degradation, the humiliation, the lack of mercy, even for the elders and the babies. It was at once something completely new and at the same time eerily and unmistakably and sickeningly familiar. Maybe you heard about the children, Amelia and Michaeli, six and 10 years old, who hid silently in the closet for 11 hours as their parents were murdered before their eyes. What makes you think these stories are even true, ask the Hamas supporters on the college campuses. The Jews run Hollywood. It's literally their job to make up stories. Well, we know this story is true because those children are the family of our beloved board member, Liz Hirsch. And their parents, Liz's niece and her husband, were just buried the day that I was there walking around that kibbutz. I spoke with a beautiful young woman whose brother was killed on October 7th. The whole family had been together for Shabbat dinner the night before, and his 15-year-old daughter miraculously survived the attacks because she ch by chance decided at the last minute to do a sleepover at Safta's house, a couple of doors down. And they, who slept at Safta's house, were miraculously able to survive in their safe room, where they held the door shut with all of their might for 35 hours, as Hamas repeatedly tried to break in all day and all night on Saturday and well into Sunday. And meanwhile, back here at home, the discourse is beyond shattering. One journalist asked me this week, 
If the anti-Semitism that we're now witnessing was always there, or is it something new? But the thing is that you just don't wake up one Saturday morning to reports of mass rape and murder and the abduction of civilians and decide to take to the streets to celebrate unless you harbor a deep, latent hatred for the victims of those atrocities. I ask us to consider, could we even fathom a global news story of massacres and destruction that stirs hundreds of thousands of people around the globe to join in celebration. The dead had not yet even been counted when protesters were screaming gas the Jews outside the opera house in Sydney, Australia. A synagogue in Tunisia was torched. A professor at my daughter's university wrote a column describing the jubilation and awe of witnessing the remarkable, stunning, astounding achievements of what he called the resistance. He wrote that piece one day after the massacres. Many of the residents of Kfar Aza, including those that I spoke with, were still alive at that time, still in hiding, in closets and safe rooms, often nursing critical injuries and cradling their deceased relatives in their arms. A day after that piece was published, a protest on campus turned violent as students attempted to storm the Hillel building what Eva described to me as now the safe haven for Jews on a hostile campus, while Jewish students inside were on lockdown. And similar images have come out from many other universities across the country. I do wonder what would have happened if the protesters had actually gotten in. I wish this were just a few bad actors, but it's a movement. Columbia, Cornell, Penn, Stanford, UCLA, it wasn't born yesterday, but like the white nationalists at Charlottesville in 2017, it had always been there beneath the surface, but waiting for the opportunity and the permission to emerge into the light of day. What Trump gave to the white nationalists, these professors are giving to the anti-Semites. I am not an anti-Semitism alarmist. If anything, I know that there are many in our community who have been frustrated with me over the years that I have been maybe too understanding toward those whose behavior sometimes betrayed a kind of latent anti-Semitism. But now it's naked. It's laid bare before us in some of our most vulnerable spaces, academia, anti-racism and movement spaces. And this is a particular gut punch. We cannot build a just society, friends. We cannot build a beloved community while denying, denigrating, or diminishing the humanity of one particular group of people. And we need to speak out about that, even if that particular group of people is us. It's simply not possible. To ignore this moral blind spot is to endanger not only Jewish lives, but our democracy. I know that this Columbia professor has a heart. He seems to be truly devastated by the death toll to Palestinian civilians, but his heart somehow does not make room for the humanity of our Jewish family. We have to make sure that ours still does for his. I spoke with a friend two weeks ago now who had just learned that two of his family members in Gaza had been killed by Israeli airstrikes. And I just learned of another dear colleague in our interfaith work here in Los Angeles who suffered multiple profound losses among her extended family this past week. This is shattering. I can only imagine that she is drowning in an ocean of sorrow. As a mother, as a daughter, as a human being, as a Jew, I am heartsick because we don't have to choose. You either believe that every single person is an image of God, or you don't actually care about human life. It is Hamas that perpetrated attacks against the Jewish people, not the Palestinian people. And for those who want to smugly assert or argue that every Palestinian is Hamas, I want you to hear this. Noah Satak from the Association of Civil Rights in Israel, one of the leaders in the Israeli left, shared with me this week a study of the mindset of Gazans that was conducted by Professor Amani Jamal from Princeton in September, only days before the attacks. Professor Jamal found that 73% of the 
of Gazans favored a peaceful solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. 73%. 54% actually favored a two-state solution, which I have heard more and more people talking about once again in the last two weeks. An independent Palestine sitting alongside the state of Israel. And only 15% of the population of Gaza supported Hamas and a military solution that would ultimately lead to the destruction of the state of Israel. I ask us to think about that in the days ahead. More Americans now express that they are in favor of armed insurrection against our government than Palestinians in Gaza expressing support for armed violence against Israeli Jews. Sometimes the weekly Parsha is chillingly resonant to a world event that has just taken place. You don't have to look too hard in the text to see the stunning coincidence that this week we read of Avram, our ancestor, learning that his somewhat estranged but family is still family nephew, Lot, has been abducted and taken captive. He's in the wrong place at the wrong time, and he is taken from his home in Sodom. Vaishma Avram the moment Avram learns of his nephew's captivity, he springs into action. He will go to the end of the earth to get his family home. Years later, Rambam, Maimonides, codifies this instinct in no uncertain language. There is simply no greater mitzvah than the redemption of the captives. And Rav Yosef Karo takes it even further, saying every moment that passes without doing everything in our power to redeem the captives is the equivalent to shedding their blood. This we must take to heart in the days ahead when we assess what each and every one of us is doing to redeem our own now 222 captives. Avram realizes that he has to do everything in his power to retrieve his family, and he does. He is blessedly able to bring his nephew and all the other captives with him back home. But the story does not end there. The very beginning of the next chapter, God speaks to Avram and says, al Avram, don't be afraid. In the beginning of chapter 15 of Genesis. It's a perplexing twist in the narrative. Why would Avram be afraid? He's just vanquished his enemies, the powerful kings who had wrought untold damage on the land. But the rabbis teach that even though the war had ended, Avram never stopped worrying, never let go of a persistent post-war apprehension that maybe there was one innocent, one righteous or God-fearing person among the people that he had killed, even in the pursuit of his just cause. Now here's something interesting that you might not have noticed in the text. When Avram is told of his family member's abduction, that Lot has been taken captive, he is called for the very first time Avram Ha'ivri, Avram the Hebrew. Avram the Hebrew. We've met Avram nine times already at this point, but this is the first time he's called a Hebrew. He is a son, he's a husband, he's an uncle, he's a schemer, a teacher, a businessman. Why now is he called a Hebrew? Because sometimes we learn it comes all at once. The moment Avram learned that his family had been taken captive, he became something new in the world. He became an Ivri, a Hebrew. This moment changed him, like it has changed some of us. He had always been one who crosses over, but now this wound, the forced captivity of his nephew, prompted a fundamental change in his identity. He is no longer the person that he was before. And what is this new Avram, this Hebrew, this Ivri? According to the Midrash, to be an Ivri is to know that sometimes the entire world will stand on one side and you will be on the other. It means to be a fierce fighter for your family, a person who is well aware of your own vulnerability and committed to doing everything in your power to right the wrongs that others have committed against your family. But that is not all. 
It also means to be a person who will never, ever stop worrying, will never, ever close their heart and cease to consider the impact of their actions on others, the harm that they may be causing. What are we supposed to do, friends, with all of the anguish that we're holding in such a painful and morally confusing time? We must strive to be Ivrim, to be Hebrews, to hold our families with deep care and with deep love. Remember Liz's family, Smadar and Roe. We initially thought that those two children who hid in the closet had not only lost their parents, but also their little sister, Avigail, three years old. But when I was with the survivors at Kfar Aza, I learned a different next chapter in this story, which I later was able to confirm with Liz. After her parents had died, little Avigail, three years old, raced over to the neighbor's house. The neighbor let her in, father, mother, and three children, and they went into the safe room. The father went out to fight, and when he came back, he discovered that his wife and three children and Abigail had been taken captive into Gaza. The bereft husband and father of that family was the one who pulled up a white plastic chair in the heart of Tel Aviv, Kaplan, where the democracy protests had been taking place for nearly a year, and held up a sign and began a silent protest to bring home the captives. Not just his family, all of them. And I know that we're horrified to even imagine what they've been through these past three weeks, if they are even alive. Our number one priority must be to bring them home. And Ivri does everything, everything in our power. Even if the entire rest of the world is intoxicated by violent anti-Semitism, and Ivri knows that when someone tears down the pictures of our beloveds, that we continue our fight. Even when the whole world stands on one side, the Ivri must be willing to stand on the other. But the Ivri, the Hebrew, does not stop there. The Ivri will never, ever stop crying out or mute our cries for the innocents who are suffering even across the border, even in a just war. And Ivri will hold the humanity of the Palestinians at the forefront of our hearts and minds. And that does not make us traitors, friends. That makes us descendants of our ancestor, Avraham Avinu. I want to invite you to please rise. And we will offer a prayer for the captives, a prayer for peace, a prayer for our people, for the Palestinian people, and for all of God's children, knowing and believing that a different way is in fact possible. And we will do everything in our power to help us get there.